I, I ask you that question. Obviously, there's been a lot going on uh, recently. And uh, by recently, I mean since you and Senator Blair tried to coexist in the same space. Um, what happened most recently, we just had Senator Jason Barrett on who talked about the vote to remove you from the caucus. Can you give us some detail on what led to that? Uh, well, um, it's kind of hard to nail down exactly what led to it, other than there was an animation. I didn't hear you know, his comments. Um, there was an animation or a, a word passed around that I had shared information with um, a podcaster, radio host, Tom Roten, who you, know, you, may, really, mm-hmm. you, you may know Tom. Sure. Tom has since been very emphatic that I had nothing to do with you know, the sharing of that information. And so I know the process was started based on that lie. Um, but I don't know what the story is they're selling now. What was the information that was shared, Senator Carnes? Uh, you know what was ridiculous about it is it was <laughs> it was the fact that the Republicans were having a caucus, and it was a generic agenda. Like we're going to meet at eight o'clock in the morning at noon. We're going to have some people come in and talk about you know you know items they'd like to discuss. Then we're going to eat dinner, and then we're going to you know go to the bar, basically. <laughs> Okay. And <laughs> and so uh, the sort of thing that everybody assumes that legislators are doing just as part of the normal legislative process, mm-hmm. um, I'm not really sure. And again, I think that was really just the pretext. Um, I, I'm not really sure why that would have set anybody off. It was actually pretty innocuous, but, uh, but it didn't come from me. Um, so uh, that's been made pretty clear now. So again, I, I didn't hear what, uh, you know, Barrett had to say, uh, he kept Sorry, it pretty I can't generic. Really respond. Jason kept it pretty generic. He, he said basically there's an understanding that what happens in the caucus stays within the Republican caucus and is not to be shared with the media. Is that the general understanding? Well, it actually is the, the total understanding, and it sounds like he's still pushing that lie. And they know it's a lie now. Roten's been out there, said that it was absolutely not me. Um, so they know it's a lie. Um, so if Jason's still pushing it, he's pushing something that he knows isn't truthful. Uh, well, to be clear, uh, he yeah. did not say you did that. He d- he just simply said that that's what oh, the well. rule is. He simply he just said that's what the yeah, rule is. Yeah, but if he's talking about me getting kicked out of the caucus and then he throws that in there, the implication yes. is that I did do that, right? That part is correct. So, um, you know, I mean, if, if you want to smear somebody, sometimes it's easier to do it and, and more effective to do it by not stating exactly what it is you're trying to say. Instead, you just imply it, right? Have you have so you ever implying that I did that? Right. He knows it's not true. Over, over the years, have you ever shared that information with the media? What happened? in the caucus no because i actually take it pretty seriously and i've had this stuff done to me in reverse um and so probably take it even more seriously you know i I was in a caucus once and we were discussing a piece of legislation and i said something about it and literally 30 seconds later i got a text from a lobbyist to explain to me how important you know their position was so Mm -hmm. i was like well gee somebody's sharing out a caucus you know because we hadn't even left. I mean, literally 30 seconds later, um, earlier this year, Craig Blair shared stuff out of caucus that I said in caucus with a lobbyist um, that he knew would be very detrimental to you know my campaign because this lobbyist happens to live in my district. So I've had it happen, and Craig Blair's done it to me, but um, I've never shared it. I take it serious. Any reason why they would suspect it was you who did it? Uh, I, I believe that the reason... Well, first of all, I don't think they really ever suspected that I did it. And again, uh, the what was shared was, well, Republicans meet, right? <laughs> so um, I think it was just a pretext. But um, I think that the way they sold that to some of the membership was really pretty simple. I, I haven't really even been going to caucus since about February. This whole thing has sort of degenerated into you know Craig Blair or Eric Carr. Um, you know, talking over or shouting down opinions they don't want to hear. And so it's like, well, why waste time? And I'm not the only one, by the way. There are other senators that, you know, virtually never go to caucus. I went to this one because my wife is in the Republican Women's Organization, and she is the chaplain. And they were having a meeting the same day in Charleston. And so since she was going to Charleston, I thought, well, I'll go ahead and go down and see what it is that they're talking about next year, right? (laughs) And uh, so when my wife's meeting finished, uh, which was three or four in the afternoon. I don't remember the exact time. She texted me and said, Hey, I'm walking over to the mall. And, uh, we'd already planned on grabbing dinner whenever she was finished up. And so I said, okay, I'll be over there after a bit. 
And I waited around for a couple more uh, presentations, and, and then I got up and left. Well, apparently, Roten dropped his um, little blurb on this thing around the time that I left. So, you know, they, well, see, Robert left, and he must be the one who did it. It's entirely possible that somebody else did it, you know, deliberately having seen me walk out, I suppose. But Mm -hmm. whatever happened there is either just a trick of timing or or whatever. But I went and had lunch or, excuse me, dinner with my daughter over at uh, Cracker Barrel and my wife and daughter because I got a daughter that's uh, at Marshall. And so we met in cross lanes at the Cracker Barrel and ate dinner. Bob, Bill Stubblefell, uh, were, were you at the caucus meeting where the vote was taken? No, they didn't tell anybody about this. This is like a little star chamber trial. So there were certain people who clearly did know in advance. Um, many of the people who showed up had no idea what was coming. There were people that didn't go to that caucus meeting because they didn't think anything important was going to happen. Um, the ostensible purpose was to finish talking about a couple of bills that they hadn't finished up on the day before. So, in other words, uh, you were not there, uh, and the uh, the agenda was not published, I gather, from what you said, a specific agenda that we're going to take a vote on uh, disinviting Bob Kearns to the caucus meeting. Nothing like that was presented. Right. Okay. In fact, I'm, I'm aware of, you know, Senator being asked, you know, are you coming to the caucus, and um, them saying, no, nah, I'm not there, and uh, no, it was, you know, you know conversation this was much designed to make sure that i have an opportunity bob we're starting we're starting to lose your cell here yeah i'm sorry can you you hear me now yes yeah yeah, that sounds better yeah okay senator this john uh, no I, i think this was designed to prevent me from being able to present any evidence no evidence was presented by the way they didn't and i want to make something clear so that people who are listening don't make a mistake. I'm not in the caucus anymore, so I'm not bound by those rules anymore. So I can tell you what happened in the caucus because I wasn't there and I wasn't allowed to be a part of it. Um, you know, two people got up, basically Eric Tarr and Ryan Weld, and told everybody how much they hated me and didn't think I should be in the caucus. Um, and, you know, Craig Blair, you know, an interesting thing is Republicans oppose um, card check. We always insist on secret ballots. But when it comes to doing something that Blair wants to do in caucus, he always makes everybody vote so he can tell who voted for him and who voted against him and who needs to be punished and so on. So, you know, in this case, um, they made their case of, you know, why that, you know, they didn't want me in the caucus. And then Blair watched and made sure everybody voted the way they were supposed to. Senator, this is John Gilstrap. There seems to be quite the chafing point here. Um, What? And in fact, you you. uh, surmised that the the leaking of information was the pretext that's uh, the, the word you used um to have you removed from the caucus that what is the ulterior motive but what, what's the what's the source of the friction well obviously you know i've been on uh you know rob's program before um you know craig blair's just an incredibly corrupt guy he's selling access to the senate i can uh you know uh, either participate in that, be silent about that, or talk about that. I didn't go to Charleston to build anybody's swamp. So I talk about Craig Blair's corruption. Well, right there's one reason why they don't want me in the caucus. Y- you know, um, I push a conservative agenda. I, I do that without any shame whatsoever. Blair does not um, push a conservative agenda. He pushes a very liberal agenda. That's why he's kind of built this liberal leadership team around himself. So – I'm a, I'm a friction point because I insist on doing what Republicans are supposed to do. Corruption is a really big word. What what does what do you mean by that? Well, I'll tell you, and and I've been kind of wondering, like, why this spot right here? You know, what was the impetus? Obviously, we're getting ready to go into the session. But another thing that I was made aware of after the fact, um, and and this is another, this is more direct. This is more on point. Uh, During the last session, there was an attempt to bribe a state senator to change their vote. Um, Obviously, the the people involved in in the bribery side um, were essentially Craig Blair's top lieutenant and um, his most prolific um, lobbyist in terms of who gives the most money. Now, I don't know, know where he fits into that, but I don't think those two people did that without his um encouragement 
he just found out that I'm one of the witnesses to that bribery attempt. And I think it's being investigated, but I believe that, you know, it's kind of like a culmination of multiple things. Um, he, you know, obviously we don't like each other personally. I, I don't like crooked people and he doesn't like people who call him out. But I, I also think that I, I found out from somebody else that he found out shortly before all of this happened that I am one of those witnesses. Now, uh, Senator Robert Carnes, our guest here on the program, recently voted out of the Republican caucus Monday. The caucus took a vote. Uh, so you had brought a bunch of accusations, a uh, pretty good list, uh, about a year ago, maybe less, uh, regarding Senator Blair and the compensation he was receiving. And my understanding of that was all of that was investigated and nothing was found to be out of the ordinary. Is that not correct? No, no, we don't know what they found. They haven't released a report that I'm aware of. What we know is that the West, West Virginia Ethics Commission, which is you know where somebody um, you know filed a, an ethics complaint against him, um, took the information in. Um, we don't know what the output of that is, but we actually know you know historically that it's very rare for the Ethics Commission to do anything. So I wouldn't say that. Maybe a better way to state it is this: If somebody says, "Hey, I think Blair's padding his mileage." They would say, Senator Blair, are you padding your mileage? And he would say, no, I am not. And they would say, okay, well, thank you, sir. You know, hey, well, but, hold, hold on, after Bill. all, where does their budget come from? Hold on, Bill. I, Senator Blair is apparently listening to this interview, and he just sent me a text that said the report has been released months ago and that Senator Carnes knows that in regards to the investigation of him. Uh, well, the I'm happy to made. have him send me a copy. <laughs> okay. But the reality is that the Ethics Commission is – generally regarded as not having any teeth and they can't because who controls their budget craig blair who, who makes <laughs> who makes up the ethics commission senator carnes uh there are appointees um secretary of state has somebody this person has them i don't recall the the people that get to appoint somebody to that bill yeah that was my question uh go let's go back to the premise of why we started this uh you've been uh voted off the caucus what in reality does that mean? What? How does it affect it you? It means that I don't go do. to the Monday morning yeah. meetings, but you or, have or, you know the daily yeah. meetings. But for every everything else, you have uh, full say. So, do you get? Uh, do you lose access to some uh, some private information, some information that you need to make your votes on? No, no. What I lose, if anything, um, is. Uh, whatever it is that Blair's demanding people do, which I don't really care about, that's not the way I vote. So, um, you know, when when you have this situation where, you know, I, I euphemistically refer to it as the Blair cult project because that's really the way it functions. You've got a couple of people that orbit very close to Blair who are sort of his enforcers, and they know Blair's a clown, and they, you know, privately will say that, that he's an incompetent and embarrassment um, but in the caucus, they're Blair's enforcers, right? And then you've got a lot of people that are just afraid. You know, Blair makes it very clear. And understand something. Kicking me out of the caucus isn't because Blair thinks that he's going to bully me or buy me or anything like that. Kicking me out of the caucus is the message to other people who might be thinking about standing up and doing what's right. So I want to go back to the um – point you made earlier that Craig is a liberal and that he surrounded himself by liberal Republicans. How do you define a liberal Republican? And, and I ask you that question because I know that this line moves over time. Uh, Craig, not too many years ago, was thought by most of the voters of the Eastern Panhandle to be pretty far right conservative. Uh, now you're saying that well, he's actually so moved I to think, being a liberal. So a, a, a few points. OK, so first of all, uh, Craig tried to push a pro-life bill through the Senate last year. Um, the House ultimately rejected that, and we passed something else. The, the so-called pro-life bill that Craig got behind and pushed really hard through the Senate would have allowed the abortion clinic in Charleston to stay open. In other words, it was actually a pro-abortion bill <laughs> that would have allowed the abortion clinic to stay open. Now, later on, we passed an actual pro-life bill because he was, you know, he wanted to be able to claim that that mantle. Uh, and the day the Senate voted to pass that second version of the bill, the clinic closed, even before the governor signed the bill. In other words, the clinic knew what was real, and they knew what wasn't real. And whenever a real pro-life bill passed, they closed down. So 
that's one example. Another example would be that earlier this year, Blair pushed through the Senate uh, a bill that allows the chemical castration of children as young as 10 as part of this whole transgender thing. Now, the House sent over a pretty good bill, said no more transgender you know, surgeries and drugs for kids. And when it got to the Senate, Blair made sure that it went and, and was amended to allow for you know, transgender and, and cross-sex hormones and all that stuff for kids. That's not a conservative position. In in talking, like that's not even a lot of Democrats don't support that position. But I want to make sure I understand that correctly because I remember talking about this when this was happening, and there was an exception, an exemption that they were trying to, and I don't, I don't know that Craig was this or not, but they were trying to keep in because there was a doctor who stated once you're on these drugs, you can't clean cut off. There has to be a transitory period where you're. You're slowly weaned off uh, some of these drugs that help in transition here. So w- was that not part of that, or am I talking about two different things from what you're referring to? Two different things, two different things. The way the, way the Kubo amendment in the end that, that Blair got behind and pushed through the Senate works is as long as two doctors agree that the kid needs this, then uh, you know it'll happen, basically. I mean, that's the long and the short of it. So there was a version of it where, yeah, they got to be tapered off of the drugs, But that's not what we're talking about here. Um, And so, you know, these are not conservative positions. Um, Nobody wanted to say, look, you got to cut them off cold turkey if there's legitimately a medical reason why that can't be done. Mm -hmm. Um, Nobody, uh, well, I shouldn't say nobody, but, you know, conservatives did not want to say, but you can start new kids on this regimen as long as you get two doctors who agree. Because the reality is you can get two doctors to agree to anything. So, Senator, are, are, is it possible in your definition of of conservative uh, versus liberal? I guess are, are, are the only the only other choice. If somebody is pro Second Amendment and they're pro small government and they're all they check all of the boxes of conservatism, but they allow for exceptions for abortions for whatever reason, does that make them a rhino because there's one box that remains unchecked? No. no. No, I don't. I don't think that's exactly the way it works. I think that you start taking things. So you just asked me about two issues there. Next issue, the governor pushed for now Republicans. We're small government, cut taxes, right? And we don't like picking winners and losers. Okay, so Republicans are small government, less taxes. The, gov- the governor says, "Hey, let's cut the income tax fifty percent." He showed the math; it would work. The House comes along, looks at it, shows the math. The House sends it over to the Senate. Blair refused to allow a vote on the floor. He refused to allow a vote in committee. He refused to allow a vote in caucus on whether or not we should go along with this plan. So now we eventually did cut taxes, but we only got 21 and a quarter because of Craig Blair, no other person. So we could have had 50 percent. We only got 21. Why? Well, he wanted to spend that money on other stuff. Now, a good example of other stuff, and this ties into the winners and losers, is form energy. $300 $300 million to a company at a cost of $430,000 per job created, okay? The company wants to put coal and natural gas out of business. Their CEO said that, okay? So this is West Virginia, and we gave $300 million to a company that wants to destroy 25% of our economy. Sometime I'm going to change subjects, uh, change subjects somewhat on this. Uh, the last session, uh, there was uh, some uh, move or push to have a uh, to uh, not reelect Craig as president of the Senate. Uh, do you see that movement growing at the next session? Uh, I think that you know <laughs> Craig would certainly like to tamp that down, and the way he does that. Uh, he recruited a candidate to run against Patricia Rucker, who's over there in your area. Now, let's talk about Patricia Rucker for a second when we talk about conservative versus liberal. Patricia is the author of almost every single piece of school choice legislation, educational freedom. She's the one who uh, was the lead sponsor on Amendment 1 in uh, you know, the Constitution that made it clear West Virginia is a pro-life state. Blair recruits somebody who's clearly a lot less conservative to run against Patricia. And that would be Again, Delia yeah, why that? Because yeah. of what you're talking about, the leadership question. Okay. So, uh, uh, 
what was the how how robust was the challenge last time and considering that the uh the senate would remain pretty static as far as membership do you think the robust nature would be increased at the next uh next vote uh, you, you know one of the things that's interesting about uh, a, a legislative body i mean before i touch on that exactly you're talking about people who, honestly, it's a little bit sort of risky, dangerous, scary to put your name on a ballot. If you've never done it, it's kind of hard to understand. You're going to get up in front of people. You're going to ask for their support. You're going to make promises that you got to keep, and you know, and so on, right? I've always been amazed at how the the will and the courage that got them to office fades when they're in office. And instead, um, which parking space they have becomes an important factor in how they vote on a you know, particular piece of legislation or in caucus and so on. Um, so it's hard for me to tell you what's going to happen next time around is, is kind of where I'm going with that. But what I know is this. Craig has recruited somebody to run against me, a guy who is a lifelong Democrat, supported Biden and Obama, et cetera. He's recruited somebody you know, to run against Patricia. He continues to back uh, Mike Maroney, who has, you know, multiple arrests for soliciting prostitutes. I'm about ten, about 10 drugs. seconds, Bob, about 10 seconds. Yep, yep. So, so what do I think? I don't know. The voters will get to decide whether or not Craig Blair gets to continue with this. Hey, uh, by the way, real quick, uh, do you vote again for a new Senate president in January, or once you're in for the beginning of the term, does that last for two years? After the next election. Next election. So he, Craig does return in January as president. All right. Thank you, yeah. Senator Carnes. Appreciate your time this morning. Thanks, Thanks Bob. Bye.